54% of the world's population lives in our cities. In developing countries, one third of that population is living in slums. 75% of global energy consumption occurs in our cities, and 80% of gas emissions that cause global warming come from our cities. So things that you and I might think about as global problems, like climate change, the energy crisis, or poverty, are really, in many ways, city problems. They will not be solved unless people who live in cities, like most of us, actually start doing a better job. Because right now we are not doing a very good one. And that becomes very clear when we look into three aspects of city life. First, our citizens' willingness to engage with democratic institutions. Second, our city's ability to really include all of their residents. And lastly, our own ability to live fulfilling and happy. Lives. In China alone, 300 million people, some say 400 million people, will move to the city over the next 15 years. That means building the entire equivalent of the entire built infrastructure of the U.S. in 15 years. Imagine that. And we should all care about this, whether you live in cities or not. Cities will account for 90% of the population growth. Cities are places of celebration, personal expression. You have the flash mobs of pillow fights that. I've been to a couple. They're quite fun. You have <laughs> cities are where most most of the wealth is created, and particularly in the developing world, is where women find opportunities. That's a lot of the reason why cities are growing very quickly. So this is my image of the city of the future, <laughs> in that it's a place for people. When people you know. think about cities, they tend to think of certain things. They think of buildings and streets and skyscrapers, noisy cabs. But when I think about cities, I think about people. Cities are fundamentally about people, and where people go and where people meet are at the core of what makes a city work. So even more important than buildings in a city are the public spaces in between them. And today, some of the most transformative changes in cities. Are happening in these public spaces. I want to use an example of Rio that we're doing in Madure in this region to see what we should think is our first commandment. So every time you see a concrete jungle like that, what you got to do is find open spaces. If you don't have open spaces, you got to go there in open spaces. So go inside these open spaces and make that people can get inside, can use that spaces. This is、uh, going to be the third largest park in Rio by June this year. It's going to be a place where people can meet, where you can put nature.、Uh, the temperature is going to drop two, three degrees centigrade. So, the first commandment I want to leave here tonight is: city of the future has to be environmentally friendly. Every time you think of a city, you got to think green. You got to think green and green. So, moving to our second commandment that I wanted to show you. Let's think that cities are made of people. I mean, lots of people together. Cities are packed with people. So, how do you do? You move these people around. When you have 3.5 billion people living in cities, by 2050 it's going to be 60 million people. The second commandment I want to leave here tonight is: a city of the future has to deal with mobility and integration of its people. Moving to the third、uh, commandment, and this is、uh, the most controversial one. Has to do with the favelas, the slums,、uh, whatever you call it. There are different names all over the world. But the point we want to make here tonight is: favelas are not always a problem. I mean, favelas can sometimes really be a solution. A city of the future has to be socially integrated. You cannot deal with a city if it's not socially integrated. City of the future has to use technology to be present. I mean, I don't need to be there anymore to know and to administrate the city. But、uh, everything that I said here tonight, or the commandments, are means, are ways for us to govern cities. I mean,、uh, invest in infrastructure, invest in the green, open parks, open spaces, integrate socially, use technology. 
But by the end of the day, when we talk about cities, we talk about gathering of people. And we cannot see that as a problem. That is fantastic. If there's 3.5 billion now, it's going to be 6 billion, then it's going to be 10 billion. That is great. That means that we're going to have 10 billion minds working together, 10 billion talents together. So uh, a city of the future, I really do believe that it's a city that cares about its citizens, integrates socially its citizens. A city of the future is a, is a city that can never let anyone out of this great party, which are cities. Thank you. The dominance of the city as the primary mode of, of urban living is one of the most extraordinary demographic reversals in history. And it all happened so fast. I mean, you all know the figures, right? There's 7.3 billion people in the world today. There'll be 9.6 billion by 2050. But consider this one fact. In the 1800s, one in 30 people lived in cities. Today, it's one in two. And tomorrow, virtually everyone is going to be there. And this expansion in urbanization is going to be neither even nor equitable. The vast majority, 90 percent, will be happening in the South, in cities of the South. So urban geographers and demographers, they tell us that it's not necessarily the size or even the density of cities that predicts violence, no. Tokyo, with 35 million people, is one of the largest and some might say safest urban metropolises in the world. No, it's the speed of urbanization that matters. I call this turbo-urbanization, and it's one of the key drivers of fragility. When you think about the incredible expansion of these cities, and you think about turbo-urbanization, think about Karachi. Karachi was about 500,000 people in 1947, a hustling, bustling city. Today, it's 21 million people. And apart from accounting for three-quarters of Pakistan's GDP, it's also one of the most violent cities in South Asia. Dhaka, Lagos, Kinshasa, these cities are now 40 times larger than they were in the 1950s. Now take a look at New York. The Big Apple, it took 150 years to get to 8 million people. Sao Paulo, Mexico, took 15 to reach that same interval. Now, what do these medium, large, mega and hyper cities look like? What's their profile? Well, for one thing, they're young. What we're seeing in many of them is the rise of the youth bulge. Now, this is actually a good news story. It's a function of reductions in child mortality rates, right? But the youth bulge is something we've got to watch. What it basically means is the proportion of young people living in our fragile cities is much larger than those living in our healthier and wealthier ones. In some fragile cities, 75 percent of the population is under the age of 30. Think about that. Three in four people are under 30. It's like Palo Alto on steroids. Now, if you look at Mogadishu, for example, Mogadishu, the mean age, is 16 years old. Ditto for Dhaka, Dili and Kabul. And Tokyo? It's 46. Same for most Western European cities. Now, it's not just youth that necessarily predicts violence, right? That's one factor among many. But youthfulness combined with unemployment, lack of education, and this is the kicker, being male is a deadly proposition. They're statistically correlated, all those risk factors, with youth, and they tend to, to relate to increases in violence. Now, for those of you who are parents of teenage sons, you know what I'm talking about, right? Just imagine your boy without any structure, with those unruly friends of his, out there cavorting about. Now, take away the parents, take away the education, limit the education possibilities, sprinkle in a little bit of drugs, alcohol and guns, and sit back and watch the fireworks, right? I mean, the implications are disconcerting. Right here in Brazil, the life expectancy is 73.6 years. If you live in Rio, I'm sorry, shave off two right there. But if you're young, you're uneducated, you lack employment, you're black and you're male, your life expectancy drops to less than 60 years old. There's a reason why youthfulness and violence are the number one killers in this country. Okay, so it's not all doom and gloom in our cities, right? After all, cities are hubs of innovation, dynamism, prosperity, excitement, connectivity. You know, they're where the smart people gather. And those young people I just mentioned, they're more digitally savvy and tech-aware than ever before. And this explosion in the Internet and mobile technology means that the digital divide separating the North and the South between countries and within them is shrinking. But as we've heard so many times, these new technologies 
are dual-edged, right? 